The term regulatory capture is a dry sounding expression that uh, encapsulates a lot of activity that is harmful to the American people. It basically describes the process by which the people who uh, enforce our regulations, which is to say the protections that we have given ourselves against uh, malfeasance and incompetence and other forms of misbehavior, the people who enforce those protections are sometimes in effect captured by the industries uh, they are meant to regulate. Now, our, our, I've written about our next guest. I have, uh, you know, followed uh, her story. Carmen Sagara was a bank examiner with the uh, New York Federal Reserves, uh, and she was among in the team that oversaw uh, Goldman Sachs. And in the course of her work there, uh, she encountered I'll let her tell the story, but shall we say certain pressures. So uh, Carmen Segarra is now an attorney in private practice, and she is the author of a book entitled Non-Compliant, uh, A Lone Whistle, and my computer just went blank, A Lone Whistleblower Exposes the Giants of Wall Street. Non-Compliant, uh, A Lone Whistleblower Exposes the Giants of Wall Street, and she joins us now. So first of all, Carmen Segarra, thank you for coming on the program. Thank you for having me. So, uh, secondly, you, uh, I think you came to public attention. Uh, well, tell us the story uh, rather than me telling it. Oh, <laughs> sure. Um, so, I was um, hired by the Federal Reserve about three years after the financial crisis, and I was assigned to supervise Goldman Sachs. Um, during the course of the months that I worked there, um, I encountered a number of um, issues um, at Goldman Sachs, and when the time came to prepare the annual report, which is part of um, the Federal Reserve supervision function, it's the report that is used in among other reasons or among other things to decide how much a bank can borrow from the discount window. In other words, how much money they can borrow from the U.S. government to do their activities. Um, my bosses essentially wanted me to delete information from the report. And I think the book makes a very um, systematic, compelling case for showing you exactly how they went about doing that deliberately over the months that I was um, supervising Goldman Sachs. So I... At some point, I refused to um, delete critical findings from the report. My bosses fired me, um, and I sued the Federal Reserve, and um, the complaint was dismissed. Oh, the complaint was dismissed? That's how you end? Uh, um, because you had, among other things, a recording, did you not? Yes. So yes. you would... Re so, so uh, Carmen, Carmen, let me recap what I heard. You tell me what I got right and wrong. I mean, really big picture. Okay, yeah. so we pass certain laws and regulations in this country uh, to prevent, uh, you know, abuse of the system, in this case by bankers and financial executives, and the, if they do abuse the system in some way, if they fail to follow the rules of the road, if you will, there are certain consequences, supposed to be certain consequences for it. That's what the democratic process has decided. And, um, your job and the job of your superiors was to track that and enforce those consequences. They could be anything from, yeah, I don't know, a violation of the law to uh, uh, you don't, you mentioned the discount window to you don't get virtually free money from the United States government to do whatever you want with if you break the rules. And what you're saying, as I understand it, is that uh, you discovered uh, incidents where Goldman Sachs was breaking the rules, but you were told to remove them from your report, in effect, to cover them up so that they didn't have to face the consequences, they at Goldman Sachs, of their own actions. Is that a fair interpretation of what you've just told me? Yeah, that is a fair interpretation. Um, and I think that, um, you know, the rules that have been passed, some of them are most of them are actually very old. I mean, this is not news. This is not, you know, the rules that we were talking about have been in place before Dot Frank. Um, and I think it's, it's appalling, <laughs> frankly. What I saw as a taxpayer was so disturbing. Um, just a lot of 
regulators deliberately not doing their jobs, deliberately engaging in a refusal to hold um, Goldman Sachs executives and employees accountable. Um, and that's just not the way the system is supposed to work. Well, uh, I couldn't agree with you more, uh, Carmen Segarra. I guess my question for you would be, you know, I mentioned in the introduction uh, to this segment, uh, I mentioned the idea of regulatory capture. And one big piece of that is that if you go to work, the, the sense that if you go to work, let's say for the Federal Reserve, or if you go to work for another regulator, or perhaps uh, uh, a Justice Department investigating bank crimes, whatever it might be, that if you go to work on the government side enforcing the rules, that a lot of people have the expectation that they can kind of cash out at some future date by going to work for the companies or banks or whatever that they regulate. And so they don't want to be too tough on them because that will spoil their chances to make a lot of money down the road. Am I being unfair or is that something, is that part of your sense of what's going on here? I mean, I think that's part of the sense, but I don't think it's a complete picture. Um, I think that there is more than that going on. Um, I think, for example, I was part of a group of people who was brought in um, from the industry. I mean, it's to help clean the mess up that you know the government knew was very much um, in place at the New York Fed. Um, so I didn't need to work at the Federal Reserve to get a job outside in the industry. I had been working in the industry for 10 years. Um, my specialization had been in cleaning up messes um, inside banks. And so I had an expertise in exactly what they were bringing me in to do. Um, what you see is a combination of what you describe, but you also see a lot of people who, you know, inside the Federal Reserve, it works a lot like an escalator. It's like you have to prove yourself and you have to work your way up in order to, when you're 10, 20 years into your career, um, have a hope of maybe getting a job outside um, in a big bank. Having said that, all of these supervisors are paid are paid plenty of money. I mean, this is this is these are not minimum wage jobs. Um, and in fact, when it comes to the legal and compliance um, area, the 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 salaries and the pay is actually very comparable to what you would get. Um, outside at a big bank and the hours are much better. So you can make an argument that you make more money per hour working for the Federal Reserve than you do working for a big bank. So what we see then is, a, 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 how do you read? You, you had people telling you, for, first of all, I want to talk about the kinds of things you saw. Uh, and, uh, you know, you said you were shocked and disturbed by what you saw, and yet you came from the industry. So, uh, you know, the, they were obviously, or at least to me, obviously, you know, pretty egregious violations, or you felt them to be, uh, but nevertheless, you were asked to remove them. So I guess I'm going to first ask you to describe some of those violations and then describe how and perhaps why you were asked to remove them. So tell me and tell us as an audience uh, what some of those violations might have been. Um, so what you really have is a combination of things that are going on. And again, the, the book sort of really focuses um, on my experience supervising Goldman Sachs. And so it doesn't speak to um, how it works at other banks. And that doesn't mean that it doesn't work the same. Um, in some cases it does, in some cases it works differently. Um, but I tried to write a, a story that was personal and from a first-hand account to really help the average person who doesn't know how this works to understand how it works. So I take you into the room when you are, for example, or when I am, for example, meeting with Goldman Sachs executives and they are, for example, telling me very clearly, oh, we don't have to comply with the law because, and then they give a bogus reason, like, oh, because our clients have so much money. Well, the law doesn't distinguish between how much money you have. The law is the law and it applies to everyone. You know, it doesn't matter if you have a hundred dollars on your bank account or you have a million, you know, how your bank account functions, it has to be the same. So you see these executives lying which, you know, lying is, lying to a federal bank examiner is a crime. 
Um, you see these executives blatantly claiming and saying that they don't have to comply with the law. And then you see sort of, you know, my colleagues, especially those that were brought in from the outside relatively recently going, yeah, that's wrong. You know, we would not working inside a bank be allowed to get away with either deciding that we're not going to implement a compliance program because we don't think the law applies to the bank. Um, so we are raising this to management um, within the Federal Reserve. And what we see are colleagues that are laughing it off, excusing it off, um, or pretending that they didn't hear that, or even worse, you know, I had people tell me, you didn't hear that. Literally, you didn't hear that. That didn't happen. And so all of these things are going on and you begin to question, you know, your reality. It's like you're you're going every day to work and you're like, what is this place? Who are these people? You know, it's like we're paying them to enforce these rules and they are listening and hearing and seeing Goldman Sachs not enforcing them and turning their eyes, not just turning the eyes the other way, sometimes actually helping and aiding and abetting to allow them to do these things. Well, what kind of, uh, I guess let me ask you this question, and again, we're talking with Carmen Segarra, who is the author of the new book, Noncompliant, A Lone Whistleblower, Exposes the Giants of Wall Street. So uh, I guess, you know, look, you came from the industry, you weren't, as the old expression goes, you weren't born yesterday, you know, so you'd seen how business works, yet you were shocked, you were shocked by, uh, you know, the reaction of some of your colleagues. So I guess my question would be, uh, and, uh, you know, you don't have to name the individuals, but uh, unless you want to, but uh, my question, what kinds of people within the Federal Reserve would give you this, you know, gaslighting kind of that didn't happen or would tell you don't report that or whatever? What kind of, who were they? What were their roles? Uh, why would they say such things to you, do you think? Well, I mean... There, there's a number of things that were going on, right? So when we were brought in um, as part of the group, we were told, oh, we have this group of supervisors that have been identified as um, people that are on their way out because they were part of the group of people who were supervising the banks um, during the financial crises. And we are going to be facing them out, but we're not sort of firing them. We're just giving them the opportunity to find other jobs. Um, and so they got this special um, titles and, and, you know, job descriptions that were essentially doing nothing. Um, and they were just sort of sitting there and we were told, well, the work that we're going to be doing is the actual supervision work that is going to be um, used to supervise these banks. So you have a mixture of, you know, very old employees, you have younger employees, but that have been there for, you know, at that point for more than five or seven years, they have been there through the crisis. Um, and, you know, just people that, that knew what was going on and were part of the old system. And what I saw as the months progressed was that while the work of my group was being curtailed, these people were getting promoted to more senior positions, um, despite the fact that they were sitting there doing nothing um, and proactively blocking and preventing um, people like me from, from doing work. Um, those people are still working, a lot of them at the Federal Reserve. Some of them have moved on to other positions. They have been rewarded for their bad behavior with promotions. Um, and so we as taxpayers are left to wonder, you know, if we know that this is, the system is not working for us, um, what are we going to do about this? So what you're describing, Carmen Segarra, is, is a pattern of, is an institutional problem. So yeah. you have on the one hand in your book, you have your personal story and your personal experiences, but what, what you're describing is, is an institution that rewards those who don't rock the boat, who in fact proactively prevent boat rocking from taking place, and at the at, at, while at the same time kind of suppressing or discouraging uh, those people who really want to do the job they were brought in to do, that's an institutional problem. Now, I have thoughts about that, why that might be, but I'm especially interested in your thoughts about why that might be. Um, I think it's hard to say. Um, I think for me, what was so surprising was just the 
you know, it really felt like I was living George Orwell's 1984. I mean, I remember, for example, one meeting where I'm meeting with a, a long-term supervisor. This person was promoted eventually, and you read about the promotion in the book. Um, and this person is sitting there telling me, you know, that there are all of these anti-money laundering violations going on at Goldman that have been identified by regulators, not just in the U.S., but, you know, in the U.K., in Switzerland. And then this person is telling me, oh, but, you know, those violations, it's, you know, don't look at them. It's like, we don't really even know if they happen, so to speak. Um, and so the person goes on to give um, certain reasons as to why that person believes that, that this just shouldn't be the case. Um, and so I'm just sitting there and right next to this person is another person saying um, sort of, yes, they did happen, right? <laughs> and this is a problem. And I'm sitting there and what it is, is just this person is trying to recruit me to their side to help them um, not enforce the anti-money laundering rules to Goldman Sachs. I don't know why somebody that is a well-paid employee um, engages in that kind of behavior. I think that's a very speculative thing. But what I was left to wonder is, you know, really, this is a well compensated person. Why is this person um, allowed to do this? Um, why are they engaging in this type of behavior? And I can't speak for them, but you know, as an American, this deliberate misuse of my taxpayer dollars, um, especially right after the crisis when there were so many um, qualified people that were just unemployed. I mean, it's not like the US um, or the industry lacks the talent or lacks for people who would be willing and able to take those positions and actually do the job the right way. Um, so why these people were allowed to remain in those positions and get rewarded for their bad behavior is just a mystery to me. Again, we're talking on the zero hour to Carmen Segarra, who is a, an attorney, a former bank and examiner for the New York Federal Reserve and author of the new book, Non-Compliant, A Lone Whistleblower Exposes the Giants of Wall Street. I'm glad we're talking a little bit, Carmen, about your, uh, your personal feelings uh, in all of this. Uh, I'm going to ask you a crazy question now, so yeah. bear with me. Um, did you ever see the movie Chinatown? Um, yes, a very long time ago. Yeah, I mean, uh, as you were describing the strange emotion of the strange feelings of these people, you know, sort of, uh, uh, you know, so that it didn't happen or it doesn't matter or whatever. I just, just kept thinking about that last scene in Chinatown where someone says, forget it, Jake, it's Chinatown. You're, you're, it, it's almost, you know, I was trying to figure out, as you say, it's speculative and I, I don't, I wouldn't put you on the spot to answer, but it's, it, it sounds like it's a combination maybe of, you know, institutional drift uh, and, and people be, becoming cynical on the job or, or human nature and not wanting to, I don't know. I mean, it, it could be so many different things from, from some kind of corruption to regulatory capture to just, you know, I've seen way worse than that. It doesn't matter, you know, and, uh, but it sounds like for you, it was very, very disorienting when it, when it would happen to you. Yeah, it was, but it was also, you know, in terms of um, the ensuing years, it's also very disturbing. I mean, anything that happens to the US dollar is something that should matter to every American, irrespective of their political views. I mean, if you don't want your hamburger to cost 20 more dollars than it does now, because we have to bail out these banks in the next financial crisis, um, we need to care and educate ourselves and pay attention to these issues. Um, I'll give you an example. You know, I'm sitting there and this is again this is a story that is very clearly outlined in the book i am supervising the unit that is being overseen by david solomon david solomon was recently named the new ceo of goldman sachs um this was it's one of the central stories in the book you very clearly see how goldman lied to the fed um, lie to other regulators, how they were caught red-handed. Even a judge um, is, issued a, a legal opinion and in the legal opinion said, you know, it's, it would behoove you to settle before even more things come out. Um, and then you see, you know, time passes and then you, you, you see, okay, I, I got fired even though I was raising this as an issue. You see these people, my fellow um, 
regulators that help to suppress this get promoted, and then you see them in the ensuing years not stop David Solomon from becoming CEO of Goldman. How do you think I'm going to feel when David Solomon and his buddies at Goldman need another bailout? And I am told by the federal government that they're going to take my tax dollars, you know, to bail them out. I mean, me, who was there, who was raising these issues, who was saying we cannot allow this to continue to happen. Um, and I think what the book tries to do is try to bring it down to the level that to a level that people can understand. And I think that's really important because when we talk about these concepts, it can get really intellectual and mm -hmm. esoteric and, and that's good and that's important. But these are problems that affect the average American. And I think we need to start sort of talking about them in terms that people understand and sort of give people the tools to educate themselves, to understand this is what's going on. This is why nothing has changed. Um, this is why we're going to have a repeat of the same behavior when the next crisis comes around because the same people are in the same positions and have been rewarded with more um, senior positions. And that makes it very difficult for the American taxpayer to protect themselves um, because it sort of puts us all in a position of, um, well, how do we how do we stop this from, from happening? You know, it's a new law isn't going to get us there. I mean, all the laws are in the book. This is a problem of enforcement or biased enforcement of the law. Um, and we really need to make a systemic cultural change and make a decision as individuals that we're going to stop rewarding this bad behavior in our daily lives and in every way that we can. You know, I think that's really well said, and it, it, it's it, it, it's principle number 101 in law enforcement or criminology that if someone is not punished for committing a crime uh, or breaking the law, they will continue to break the law in exactly the same way. So, And I think you make a great point about the fact that this isn't some abstract intellectual exercise or arcane financial rules that don't really affect us, that it could affect... E uh, look, the, the, the last... Wall financial crisis 2008, which was caused by the misbehavior on Wall Street, probably of the kind that, that you experienced, that cost families an enormous amount and, you know, wages have yet to fully recover from that. So, so it's costing us all a fortune or it has cost us all a fortune already. But, but to help people, I think, because you do make a great point there, what kinds of violations are we talking about that could lead to another crisis? What kind of violations did you see? What kind of violations are you worried about? Well, I mean, I think it's, you know, I, I will give you examples, but I'll start by saying that there are so many and, there, you know, it's, it's, it's almost like it's too many to count. And I think um, one of the one of the reasons I wrote the book was to really give people a sense of the depth and the scope of, of what we're talking about. I mean, we're talking about a failure to comply with laws that are applied to retail accounts. We're talking about essentially, you know, so, I mean, it's, it's sort of like, in my opinion, um, based on my experience, you know, essentially de defrauding public pension funds of their money. Um, the El Paso Kinder Morgan case is a great example of that. I mean, when there's less money um, available for pension funds to pay out um, their pension holders, everybody suffers. Um, and because these things are systematically not being, these rules are not being complied with, then it gets, it gets really tricky. I mean, the book sort of talks about the fact that everybody knew that these issues were were a problem, you know, Goldman Sachs having mandates in terms of, you know, stocks that they need to buy or not buy for pension funds and not complying with them. Um, you see violations of blue sky laws. Um, you see violations of, you know, anti-money laundering rules. I, I, I could, you know, the, you know, wealth management rules, um, pension fund rules. I could go on and on and on and on. Um, but I mean, the real, the real problem is that it's just a systemic culture of non-compliance that is being systematically rewarded. Um, so it's just, you know, a, a culture of, of non-compliance with the law. Um, and we know it, um, the Fed knows it, 
and they are not doing anything more than a token action here and there when the public or the press makes a little bit of noise um, to really stop it. And that sort of creates a systemic risk that creates an, an imbalance. I mean, I think one of the points I tried to make in the book is that how is Goldman different than the other banks and how the fact that they're allowed to get away with this is sort of can be, you know, for some people will read it as we are creating a systemic imbalance because we're letting one bank get away with things that we don't let other banks get away with. Um, I think that you know, some people will reach that conclusion from reading the book. Um, I would say that as a general martyr from like a larger 50,000 foot level standpoint, um, it is very important for the US banking system to have fair rules that are being enforced against all the banks equally. That is essential in order to engender trust in the public um, for people to feel comfortable to keep their money in banks. If you know that the game is rigged and that you know some banks have to comply with some rules but not others, that seeds um, mistrust and that sort of spreads through the system and it becomes really problematic and all it takes is one little random incident to sort of tip the scale um, in a direction where we all end up at getting hurt. I mean, having more money or less money is not going to take away from the impact. Um, I think the financial crisis made that very clear. Yeah, and, and I think, you know, I, I, only thing I would add, I would add nothing, actually, but I, I, I would point out that, you know, when you talk about something like failure to apply the laws that pertain to retail accounts, another way to say that is cheating customers. When you talk about, you know, money laundering rules, you're really talking in some cases, not necessarily in Goldman's, I don't know the details, but you're talking in, 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 in certainly in publicly uh, documented bank cases about helping, you know, the 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 uh, drug uh, gangs in Mexico that are slaughtering people. You know, I mean, it's just, you really, when you put it on a human level, you're really talking about enabling some really crummy behavior. So I think your book does a great job in uh, illustrating how that, what you, you know, that culture of non-compliance comes to be. And, and, and I do hope that people read it. Any last thoughts before I let you go? Um. Well, I would just like to say thank you so much to you and to your audience for, for giving me the opportunity to share these concerns. I really do, you know, for me, it was very difficult book to write um, because I'm not a writer um, by profession. I'm just a lawyer. But I really um, put myself through the ringer, so to speak, to put this book out there because I realized that I had amassed um, inadvertently just by doing my job an enormous amount of evidence, you know, thousands of pages and you know, over 40 hours worth of recordings. Um, and I think it's a very important story for people to read. Um, and I think that those who do will find um, the warnings that it carries um, to be very important, but also it will enable them to really think about how to protect themselves, how to protect them, their families, and to really think about how to you know, in their daily lives begin the systemic change that we need, where we need to stop rewarding bad behavior and we need to start um, rewarding good behavior um, in, in our daily lives for, for this to change. And well, well said, and I can tell you, I am a writer, and it's always hard. It's never, if it's easy, you're not doing it right. So, Carmen Segarra, uh, thank you for writing the book. Thank you for coming on the program. The book is Non-Compliant, A Lone Whistleblower Exposes the Giants of Wall Street. Again, thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me.